Hello, uh, in this video I'm going to be talking about updates to WebR's developer API in WebR 020. So I'm going to jump straight in there and talk about some important performance improvements that we've made while using WebR with other JavaScript uh, frameworks. So it is possible to work entirely within WebR and, and return uh, images directly from WebR's graphics devices, but you might want to also integrate WebR into uh, external JavaScript frameworks, um, including visualization uh, packages. Um, so there's an example sort of workflow shown on the screen there that, that you might want to do. Uh, so you would, after initializing WebR, you, you can imagine that you, you have some JavaScript data um, and you want to get that data into R so we can process it in some way. So uh, WebR has APIs to do that. Uh, here, for example, that, that JavaScript data is being bound to a variable in the global environment um, in, in, the R, uh, in the running R process. Once uh, that's been done and that data is transferred to the R worker thread, uh, you can evaluate some R code. Uh, here, um, just the, the function do analysis is being being evaluated, um, but this could really be anything in R. You know, this could be something quite complicated, like, such as a, uh, some kind of complicated data manipulation with dplyr, or or some kind of uh, sophisticated statistical analysis with with uh, tidy models. Uh, in any case, um, once once you've done that um, well, done that computation, uh, you you'll be returned uh, an R object will will be returned to you, um, and then you can convert that R object uh, back into the the JavaScript environment uh, with this two JS method. That data is transferred from the R worker environment back to back to the JavaScript environment where where you can use it um, in in some way. Um, so uh, if, if this is the kind of workflow that, that as a web art developer you'd be inter uh, interested in, and what we want to do is make sure that that transferring of data from the JavaScript environment into R and back out of R into the JavaScript environment is as efficient uh, and performant as possible. Um, and we've made some uh, changes in WebR 020 to, uh, to support that. Um, that, that transfer uh, was originally done by encoding the data in, in a format called JSON. And, and that's been replaced, replaced with uh, something called the message pack protocol, uh, which is uh, binary based instead of text based and, and uh, more, more efficient in, in other ways. Initial testing shows um, an order of magnitude performance improvement with, with this change. So it was, it was well worth looking into, um, into, especially when working with large sets of uh, JavaScript data. Um, so if you are uh, working in this way, um, an example now is, is, is shown on the screen of what, what you can do by, by uh, moving data in and out of, of the R environment. Um, so here, the, the start of this example uh, installs an R package just to get some data. It's installing the, the Palmer Penguins uh, package. Then uh, the next part of the, the example is uh, basically just grabbing that data. So here we're, we're evaluating some R code, but really we're, we're just returning the, the Penguins data object. That's being converted into JavaScript and then uh, transferred uh, into a slightly different format. There's, there's no real computational happening here on, on lines 8 to uh, 16. It's just it's just changing the shape of the data uh, to better match um, data that is understood by uh, the observable visualization framework, a, a JavaScript uh, framework. If you have used Observable before, you probably recognize these next lines. They, they should be fairly familiar. They're, they're the standard... Um, a uh, standard way to, to draw a, uh, a dot plot in, in Observable. Um, so that can now take that data that came from R that could have been uh, uh, modified and, and comp uh, computed on in, in a sophisticated way um, and then uh, plotted in, in, in the JavaScript uh, native environment. And when you do that, uh, this is what you get, uh, a plot that looks like this, uh, produced by Observable, um, but with the data itself coming from R. So uh, I think I, I like this example because it demonstrates uh, one of the real benefits to, to web technologies in general, which is uh, interconnectivity. You know, it's very easy to flexibly connect different projects together when, when you're working on the web. And I think this is a good example of that when it comes to uh, joining WebR in, as part of a, a wider JavaScript project. Another change we've made uh, is for TypeScript users. So um, when, when you're working in TypeScript, it, it's really important to, to pay attention to the types of objects. And, and that's true of uh, objects that are coming from R2. Um, in this example, uh, you can see that we're, we're just evaluating this string here, which produces an, an R double object. And then we're running a method toNumber, uh, which exists um, on, on a WebR 
double object um, and just converts that number into a JavaScript uh, uh, number. Converts the double into a JavaScript number. Um, this is actually an error under TypeScript though. And, and the reasoning for that is that eval r, the, the, the function that evaluates r code, could evaluate anything. You know, it doesn't have to return a double. It, it could return a character. It could return a, a logical vector. It could return pr pretty much anything. Um, so there's no guarantee that this two number method exists in the web R API to be used on, on this R object. Um, in fact, uh, eval R is just typed to return a generic R object. That, that means it really could be um, any kind of fundamental R data type. So um, there's a couple of ways to, to handle this. Um, before current release of web R, uh, the way uh, we were using was a um, TypeScript uh, type assertion feature using this add keyword. Basically, we just take the result um, and, and we say, okay, this object is definitely a double. And therefore, TypeScript is able to know that you can use the two number method on it, which uh, again, that exists in the web R API. Um, that works, uh, but it has a problem. It means that you need to know for definite what type of object is returned by eval R. You need to know exactly what R object is being returned. Um, otherwise, uh, this is an assertion, so it could be wrong. I mean, you know, I could be returning a number here, but but setting it as an R character, and that would cause issues um, further down the line. So um, web R ships with uh, type predicate functions, um, and here is an example of one of them: is R double, and similar functions exist for other fundamental R object types: is R character, is R logical. Um, and what that allows you to do is create a branch where um, the, the type of that object is checked by is our double. Uh, and if, if the R object is a double, it, that, that function returns true. And because that function returns true only in that case, TypeScript is able to deduce that inside this branch, the object uh, variable is definitely an R double. And therefore, it is perfectly fine to use that two number method that exists on, on an R double. I mean, this is quite nice because it means that you can um, return different types of object with eval R. It doesn't have to just be uh, one particular type of R object. And you could have different branches and different if statements to handle different types of object. The next thing uh, I'd like to talk about is handling errors. Um, so one of the issues that we had in uh, the previous version of WebR is that uh, if you have some R code uh, that that, that um, causes an error condition, um, the, the eval R uh, function automatically converts that into a JavaScript error, which is nice because it means that you can handle errors in R code in the native JavaScript environment. Um, the issue with that is if you have some kind of code like the following where you evaluate some R code and then and then do some JavaScript work on, on the result um, and, uh, and an error is, is thrown, um, it's not entirely clear where that error came from. Um, it could have come from inside R or it could come from deep inside this, this JavaScript function. And there were ways to handle that. You know, you could pass the message to, to work out uh, exactly what the error means uh, or, you, or you, could do, you could do other things, but they're, they're not particularly elegant. Um, so one of the changes we made is that um, errors from R now uh, are thrown as this web R error, uh, as, in, as, in, as an instance of this web R error class that exists in the in, in the package so that means that uh you can check the inst uh, the instant using the instance of uh, keyword in javascript to see is this object a web r error or is it just some other javascript error and then you can handle that error um, as you like based on whether it came from some r code or it came from from your javascript code um, it's just a, a nice easy way to be able to check exactly uh, where your your r uh, where your where your error condition came from We've made changes to the WebR Canvas messaging system. So um, as I said in, in the first video, um, we've, we've upgraded the, the WebR Canvas to have um, a lot more support for, for uh, different features, uh, including um, drawing uh, Canvas graphics on the worker thread and then displaying them on the main thread in a different way using, using off-screen Canvas. Due to those changes, we've redesigned the messaging system for the Canvas device. So uh, there, there are now um, a few different messages. So this message, uh, Canvas new page, indicates that a new plot has been created. Uh, previously, it was it was not clear uh, when a new plot had been created in WebR when using the Canvas graphics device. 
And the canvas image event indicates that there's some image data ready to be shown on the main thread. So, so the message looks like this, and the, the image property that's, that's returned in that message has a JavaScript image bitmap object. And that object uh, can be written to a canvas uh, element that's on the on the main thread. Um, so that message um, will, will indicate that a plot has been made, it's finished rendering, and it's ready to be shown. Another change we've made is um, how uh, WebR is terminated. So um, the following example is, is a useful pattern when you're using WebR to be able to continuously handle WebR output. So here, for example, uh, the, the, the read function is being used to uh, with, with a wait to, to wait for some output from R. So, so if you have some kind of long running computation that will produce output um, after, after a while, and it will it will wait for that output. It will wait for one of those output messages. Once the message has been received, it will be handled in some way. So here we have a switch uh, statement to, to handle different types of message. And then once that message has been handled, um, the the loop wraps around and and it waits for the next message. Um, and this loop is 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 an infinite loop, so it will it will continue on um, indefinitely, continuously handling messages from the bar. Uh, now, a question arises. Uh, it's possible to terminate a WebR session using, using this close function. Um, that will, will close the worker thread, terminate the thread, um, and uh, stop any, any further R processing. Um, and if you do that, uh, a question comes up of, okay, well, inside the infinite loop, you know, how do I know when to stop? It, it, that, that loop will just sit there waiting for a message that, that may never be received or will, will never be received. So... Uh, as part of the changes in the new version of WebR, when WebR is terminated using this close function, a message of type close is emitted. Um, as the very last thing it does is, is emit a message of type close. That means you can add just a single uh, case statement in, in your switch here um, to uh, exit your, your infinitely uh, running loop uh, when that closed statement is received. So that means that uh, once the WebR thread terminates and the message is being received, you don't have that function sitting there waiting for a message that will never come. So it, uh, it helps you uh, clean up after yourself when using using WebR. Okay, so that's everything I want to talk about in this video. Um, if you are interested in the WebR API, um, the documentation uh, lists uh, a lot more than I could fit in a single video. Uh, so do go and read that. Uh, and you can install WebR from, from NPM or, or you can import it from, from CDN. Um, and if you do use WebR in your own applications, um, please do let me know if you have any exciting uh, features to show me. Uh, my email, email is just shown on the screen there, uh, and, and I'd love to see what you do with WebR. Thank you.